Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Today my guest is Dr Mona Morstein, who's an ND from Arizona. She has a BS in food and nutrition and earned her ND. She did a family residency at National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Following graduation, she established a successful private practice in Great Falls, Montana, that she ran for 13 years. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Morstein. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, first of all, um, it's wonderful to have you here with us today. And did you always want to be a doctor? No, I mean, uh, I didn't. My, but my parents weren't too impressed with my desire to be a farmer uh, <laughs> when I was very young. Uh, so, but once I... You know, many people who get into medicine and integrative medicine um, have had a health problem that, uh, Linda, that they've uh, overcome using a type of natural medicine. And that happened to me very early in my life. And as a result of that, you know, slowly, little by little, I started going down uh, that pathway. I was also, you know, I have a BS in foods and nutrition from Arizona State here in Arizona, but I was really very frustrated with the education because I didn't learn how to use foods to treat diseases and help reverse them and help heal people. It's really not what it was about. And I found a book in the college bookstore called the Holistic Health Handbook which was written by uh, Berkeley University. And um, in it, I discovered all of these different ways people were looking at medicine, and I discovered naturopathic medicine there, and it wound me to go to that four-year medical school in Portland. Mm. Uh, so it was a little fortuitous, mm. my own little health improvement and plus a little gui- you know, fortuitous guidance. Let's talk a little bit about LDN. When did you first hear about LDN? Oh, uh, so low dose naltrexone, probably, I'd say around a decade ago is when I first started hearing about it Mm -hmm. and uh, learning about it, seeing some studies and, and then starting to experiment with using uh, this multifaceted uh, medicine in in different patients. And what conditions have you treated with LDN? Well, you know, I treat uh, I I see a lot of gastrointestinal concerns as well as hormonal. One of them is called small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Um, I, uh, right now, uh, I prescribe the most low dose naltrexone LDN for as use in a, as a gentle prokinetic in patients who have SIBO to help treated patients not have a recurrence. And so every day, a couple times a day, I'm prescribing it for patients with that condition. 
I also find it to be invaluable to have people with hyperthyroidism go into a really quick remission because that autoimmune disease, people can actually have a remission and heal from. And the low-dose naltrexone is absolutely a vital part of my therapy for people that are having an episode of hyperthyroidism. I also like to use it, of course, where I think most of us first started, I think, hearing about it, or I shouldn't say most, I think where at least I did, was with fibromyalgia patients. Uh, It seemed to be one of the early conditions. Uh, I have used it in also a lot of autoimmune conditions. I use it with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, have an effect on everybody, but on enough patients it does that it keeps you going. Uh, also, of course, Crohn's disease. Uh, there was used a good Pepperdine University did a, excuse me, the University of Pennsylvania, pardon me, uh, did a good study um, having remission in 89% of patients just with low-dose naltrexone. That's crazy. That's amazing, you know. So uh, with autoimmune, um, lupus patients, uh, uh, these are uh, my main areas uh, of focus with low-dose naltrexone. And in your experience, how long does it take before your patients notice any improvements? Well, it's interesting that... um, I think it's not the only therapy that I'm using, but using it in concert with multiple other therapies. In some patients, uh, you know, I, I mean, I like with the hyperthyroidism, uh, I can get, you know, really, I've seen patients have complete remissions in six weeks. That's amazing. That's great, you know, to get even off their allopathic medications, and so forth. Uh, with When everything comes into target, generally within that month or two, which is all the time patients, you know, want to spend with, you know, alternative, integ- you know, integrative medicine when they're not feeling better. But generally you want to see improvement in that first month or two. With my SIBO patients, uh, you know, it's very effective at keeping them from having remissions. Uh, so I'm very pleased with it as that gentle prokinetic. And, of course, we're usually using LDN with that balancing of the autoimmune, the T1, T2, but uh, this, this gentle prokinetic, gentle moving forward of the gastrointestinal tract uh, for SIBO patients is invaluable. And do you advise your patients to take LDN at night? I do. Now, uh, yes, I do um, think that, you know, generally we're doing between 8 and 10 at night, at least an hour away from food. Uh, I would say, uh, now, it can be taken at other times if that doesn't work. I find side effects wise, I have a few very minor amount of people, very minor, who get that, uh, you know, the vivid dreams. Uh, But uh, in uh, literally nearly a decade of using it, I've only had two patients need to, and one was a pediatric patient, need to stop it because of vivid dreaming. So it seems most people have vivid dreaming, but it just goes away from my experience and my patients after several days, and it's not too much of a problem. Uh, There may also be, um, in another minority of patients, it can make them droopy, very, you know, tired, and tired throughout the day that they can't shake it off. Also not seen commonly, but that's another reason I have to stop it. Um, but the vast majority of people uh, tend to handle it very well. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. And what dose do you normally start them on? 
Well, it depends on the person and the condition and so forth. But I would say my therapeutic range is from 1.5 to 5.0. So that's really the range where um, I work uh, with most, with really almost all patients. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned a few side effects there, but has anybody ever reported anything out of the ordinary? Out of the ordinary? Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you mean like, well, I, I mean, aside from the vivid dream, no. I, what, the, what, are you, what are you inferring? Well, what, uh, sometimes with any drug you can have some adverse effects. I just wondered if you had heard of anything that I may not have heard of. Oh, no, not at all. Honestly, aside from the vivid dreams and the tiredness, it's a, I'm good with it here. I get it from a compounding pharmacist in town. I probably make a very pure product. Uh, I haven't had any other problems with it outside of that. Mm-hmm. And what would you say the success rate has been with those patients that have continued taking it? With the SIBO patients, it's phenomenal. Uh, I would say 99, you know, easily per- percent effectiveness at preventing r- recurrence of the, you know, the allow the bacteria regrowing in the small intestine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, for the SIBO patients, I leave them on it generally for at least a year just to make, you know, so that when I can really see their their gut is better, their their diet is good, they're feeling good, everything, you know. But I'm in no rush to take them off of it because of no side effects and because of its improvements. With the hyperthyroidism people, um, I'll leave them on um, after they enter into remission. Uh, I'll still leave them on probably another five months because it, or sometimes even a little longer because they can... Uh, they, it can come back. About 50% of people get it back within the first year. So I don't want that to happen. So we just leave it on longer. Again, there's no rush or danger because it's not causing side effects. With autoimmune diseases, you know, sometimes they, I, just, I just leave them on it. You know, it's part of the treatment protocol. Um, you know, these are pretty serious conditions and I'm not emotionally involved in thinking I've got to take them off of it. And they've never really shown me any, uh, reasons that it has become a problem for them. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And now, if we may, that you are having a book coming out shortly called Master Your Diabetes, Comprehensive Integrative Approach for both Type 1 and Type 2 Diabetes. Now, that is a very interesting uh, topic there. Could you tell us about your book, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. So I'm, um, I have been seriously involved in treating diabetic patients for uh, 25 years. And um, so I've developed a certain expertise in it. I do a lot of lecture at conferences and uh, put together some seminars. I also started a nonprofit called the Low Dose Associ- um, excuse me, called the, I got my low dose naltrexone confused <laughs> with my. It's called the the uh, Low Carb Diabetes Association at lowcarbdiabetes.org. Uh, that's a, a tax, you know, a 501c3 in America kind of tax exempt education nonprofit. And what I've learned in in treating diabetes is that yes, a low carb diet is necessary, but that's not it for full care of people with diabetes. And so my, my book 
uh, goes over uh, a good workups and doing more testing than conventional care tends to do, doing diet diaries and glucographs. And I go over conventional care, uh, how it's used in around the world. Uh, and then I talk about the low carb diet, what it is, how to do it, but also exercise, stress management, sleep, how vital sleep is, healing the gut and the microbiome has, is vitally important for people with diabetes. Also, environmental detoxification is vital. Supplementation, such a great add-on to a protocol. And then medications. Uh, and then the book also talks about treating complications uh, through conventional and, you know, integrative care, diabetes and pregnancy and kids. It's, it's just a very comprehensive book. It's about 560 pages and... I was very lucky to get a good publisher, Chelsea Green Publishers in Vermont, to take it on. So I hope it helps uh, the whole world. I mean, the whole world has an epidemic, de epidemic of diabetes mm -hmm. and obesity. And, you know, we all need to come together to get this really uh, potentially devastating condition prevented and then also treated so much more effectively than generally it is with conventional care. What would you say is a healthy diet for somebody who's type 1 or 2 diabetes? What should they be aiming to eat? Well, I mean, if we look at a one-sentence definition of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, it's that these people have lost the metabolic capacity to handle carbohydrates, whether they don't produce the insulin that's needed to metabolize it effectively or whether their bodies are insulin resistant and don't listen to the signals the insulin is supposed to send to their cells. Neither way do they handle carbohydrate intake well. So in general, a low-carb diet where foods that fit into the carbohydrate category are limited uh, is the recommended way to go. There, there are four main ways that diet can play out, and either all of those ways can be very uh, valid uh, there are some outlier studies showing, however, that a, a, very, uh, a high carb diet that is vegan, uh, in other words, no animal products at all, um, such as a diet called the MAPI2 diet, which is kind of a macrobiotic vegan diet actually did do amazingly well with out-of-control diabetic patients. Um, but in reality, the foremost diet is the low-carb one. And if you had to, I know everybody's individual and their needs are individual, but what is a good basic range of nutritional supplements to take? For diabetes, yes, yeah. I mean, there are uh, um, there are um, some supplements. I think every person with diabetes should be on, such as alpha lipoic acid, turmeric, Gymnema sylvester, an herb from India, uh, benfotiamine, which is a fat. I don't know how to pronounce that word, but I think that's close. That's a fat-soluble thiamine, which is really helpful in preventing and treating complications. There's a little extra, I believe everybody should be on a multiple vitamin mineral. Everybody should be on fish oil. Uh, if we're on a low-carb diet, everybody should be on some fiber because if we're removing grains, 
from a diet, the, that fiber is going to be missed by the microbiome, and that can actually harm it, uh, especially over time. Um, and uh, so we need to put some fiber back in, which is also a good thing for people with diabetes, particularly type 2 in terms of helping their appetite and so forth. There are uh, other uh, green tea extract, uh, N-acetylcysteine, you know, some other um, um, supplements out there, but those are certainly a quick list of my favorite ones uh, that I work with patients. Mm-hmm. Also, benfotiamine. I, for, I mean, I'm not bad, but also berberine. Uh, berberine was shown in a very good study that it was equal to metformin. Uh, for uh, patients with diabetes. So berberine hydrochloride or herbs that contain high berberine levels. And you were talking about exercise. How important is exercise for people with diabetes? Well, exercise is important for people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, every, from children to the day we die, exercise is important. And, uh, and for people with diabetes, of course, it's invaluable. The muscles are the number one users of glucose. And the more we work our muscles, the more we use up glucose and can lower our blood sugars. And the more we build muscles, the more we're just constantly burning more glucose. Also, you know, just even sitting down, we're, we're burning it. Uh, also, um, exercise does so many things. Obviously, it helps with weight loss. It helps with lowering the lipid levels, the blood pressure. It elevates energy. It helps the mood. I mean, it just does slows aging. It does everything that we want to have happen in our in our lives. But the key is it's not just exercising because maybe you do that for an hour a day. But if you're sitting for the other 23, you know, hours, that's just as devastatingly detrimental as the exercise is super beneficial. So it's also teaching patients to sit less. And to just be more act like you know, just be more active day to day, even outside of exercising. Mm-hmm. Standing at your desk at the work. A lot of workplaces now are getting standing desks. There's actually a little treadmill from a company that you could just have while you're on your computer. You know, parking further than where you have to walk into the store taking stairs, you know, just, just, you know, just not sitting as much as possible um, is, is, is also very important. For our listeners who have children who may be overweight or even be obese, which is it's terrible to have a child that is um, so overweight, and of course they're at risk of type 2 diabetes and not only America, but England too, you know, there are more and more children being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. If anybody's listening with a child that has been um, diagnosed, what should they consider doing? Well, I think with children, you know, it's generally talking to the parents a lot. Most kids, of course, aren't buying their own food and stocking the house with it. That's that's parents, right? Mm-hmm. Parents are choosing to take the kids to fast food restaurants and and bring donuts home or so forth. So we have to work with parents. Uh, it's obviously not, you know, it's obviously fairly common to have overweight parents of overweight kids in general. I don't want to stereotype, but um, if we can get the whole family into eating healthier, cleaning out the house, engaging in walks, you know, after dinner and throwing the, well, throwing the ball maybe is more American, but whatever, um, 
whatever sports, <laughs> I don't know, cricket. Uh, maybe I'm just making a, a goofball of myself right now, but getting out and being active as a family, eating as a family, getting off the computer, getting away from the TV, you know, getting the kids into sport groups and, you know, activities, you know, into uh, games and, and sports outside of school even. And if we can just work on the whole family and make it a team effort, uh, we're going to have success, mm-hmm. right? Uh, yeah. I know some children who are overweight, who are around about eight, ten years old, and find it embarrassing to do sports because the other children make fun of them. How do we get around that problem? Well, obviously, that's a coaching. I mean, you've got to, look, adults let things happen or adults don't let things happen. If a coach is penalizing children who make fun of other children and those children, maybe they don't get to play today or or they have to go up and apologize. If, if adults are setting the mode for how kids need to react to kids, and maybe if that's happening, the whole, or the whole team has to sit down and get a class in being kind and being, you know, generous with your heart. I think this is more of a societal thing, but just to say the kid shouldn't be able to play because other kids are teasing him, that's, that, you know, adults need to step in to mean eight-year-olds and, and do it in a positive, you know, way of education and support and, you know, just showing kids there's better ways to, to deal with other kids, right? Yes. Um, but we, you know, we do, we need to make that not happen as adults, right? Mm-hmm. But we, because we definitely need kids to feel accepted, and uh, especially ones that want to start exercising and getting out there, you know, this, we, this has got to come together from adults and, and everybody to encourage this and to welcome it. But the good news is with changing diet, getting more exercise, feeling happier with yourself, it can be reversed in children if they follow all the right steps? Well, it can be a reverse in adults, too. Now, with kids, you know, it's not like we generally put them on a very low-calorie diet because they're going to grow. And if we just get them active and have them eating normally and on a very healthy diet, you know, they, their bodies with growth should, you know, take, you know help take care of it but we just got to get rid of the soda pop uh we you know we've got to get rid of i know i know this term bags of crisps right that's the right one for yeah so we you know all the junk food the fast food the sweets soda pop the all of that's got to go well if I'm we afraid, get rid of that yeah, yeah. we've we've run out mm-hmm. of time so if people oh, I'm sorry. um have a look um for your book, we'll put the link on the website where to buy it from. And thank you very much for sharing your oh. experience today. Oh, thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. I appreciate so much this interview. Thank you. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.